Uh, we've got three presenters here today. I'm Leanne King, Principal and Clarion Associates Chapel Hill office. And with me is Roger Walden, Senior Consultant with Clarion Associates, and Paul Cleaver, the Executive Director of the Charles House. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and turn that, this over to Roger Walden, who's going to talk a little bit about the national trends that, of the aging community. Um, and again, our apologies for this technical problem, and um, we hope that you'll stay with us for the rest of the webinar. Hello, everybody. This is Roger Walden. Um, happy that you're with us. I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the changes going on in our world, and there certainly are a lot of them, and we are dealing with them on a daily basis. Uh, I want to focus specifically on things going on in the United States that affect this topic of housing and aging populations. I listed seven uh, changes that I think are particularly important that we need to be keeping on our radar screen. The fact that our growth rate nationally is slowing, the first time that that's happened. Our population is aging as the boomers continue to go through the, uh, the, the cycle. Our household composition is shifting. The, the kinds of households we're having now very, very different from what they were a few decades ago. Our racial diversity is accelerating. Uh, this issue number five, I think, is very, very important for us as planners. Uh, because of those demographic and lifestyle changes, locational prefer preferences are changing. Uh, people uh, who are older and people who are younger want the same kinds of housing. There's a lot more interest in in-town urban living. Another issue is that real income is declining, and we need to be aware of that as we're thinking about these housing options. And last, uh, the impact of technology, which is very important on all of us, uh, including the two people that you see in the picture uh, on the right, one of them whom might be me sometime. Uh, just a graph I want to show you about uh, national trends on aging. A key point is that uh, by the year 2050, the number of Americans 65 or over will almost double from what we've had. It'll be 84 million, it's a huge number. The graph on the bottom indicates the, it, it, it's a survey of counties and uh, the percentage of the population in each county that is age 50 and over. The, uh, the green, blue bars are what the data showed us in 1990 and then yellow is what it showed us in 2010. Just a kind of a clear uh, uh, depiction illustration of how the population is aging, just, uh, uh, just useful. Uh, and then the uh, couple of terms that you'll be hearing as we go through this and that you're, I'm sure you're hearing in your workplace now, aging in place, aging in community, and multi-generational housing. Aging in place is the, the, the emphasis on providing physical and safety needs, functionality for a dwelling unit regardless of, uh, of a person's physical uh, condition. Aging in community is, is different. It's thinking about the how to make uh, 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 life exciting, uh, interactive for uh, older adults and allow them to be uh, active members of the community in which they're living goes beyond just the shelter. And the multi-generational housing, which is a, a, a big deal. It's, it's happening more and more. We're seeing articles and, and examples of, uh, house, of housing uh, types that involve multi-generations, and that's, uh, uh, that's, that's a very important trend. Uh, one of the things that we're also hearing about is universal design and about as we're thinking about these housing forms to design them such that they could be uh, lived in by people of all kinds of physical abilities and conditions, uh, multiple residential types in close proximity to each other, uh, designing individual use, units and community spaces so that anybody uh, can, be, uh, can be using them. And then another trend I just wanted to highlight that, again, this is something that's uh, coming on our radar screen more and more that a number of households are, uh, an increasing number of households have at least two adult generations. And partly based on those other trends I mentioned that uh, generations are living together increasingly. Uh, so th what this means for us, we need to be aware as planners of the housing preferences and demands that are changing so that we can adjust our plans and regulations uh, to accommodate that, and the we need to, as planners we need to be looking in our communities for at the needs and the opportunities for increasing the venues that engage people across generations to improve uh, 
uh, livability and quality of life for everybody. So that's the overview of some of those trends that are going on right now. Uh, one example that came to my mind uh, when I was thinking about this is the uh, uh, community at Burbank Senior Artist Colony in Burbank, California. Uh, this group called Engage Nonprofit Organization uh, has had great success in putting together uh, performing and visual arts facilities that bring together uh, gener all kinds of people from multiple generations and lifestyles and it's a really exciting concept that uh, I think we ought to be all looking at and seeing what we can uh, learn from it. Okay, so that's that's a little bit of introduction and now uh, uh, we've, uh, we, we talked earlier before the, before the technology glitch about the uh, APA policy guide and uh, we won't go over that again but uh, we have a reference to that you can find it on the web. Uh, APA did just prepare this policy guide about aging in community that has a number of really really wonderful uh, examples and references and ideas and recommendations and so I, I would encourage you to take a look at that. So with that uh, why don't we go uh, jump ahead to Paul Cleaver, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, when you couldn't hear me, uh, Paul is uh, uh, has been working with Charles House, and most of us here are planners. Paul is uh, somebody who has been uh, does this on the ground uh, uh, every day of the week. It's uh, he's been, had great success in in helping to improve the lives of older adults, and uh, so Paul, let's hear your story. Good afternoon, and thank you all for sticking with us through that uh, little technical glitch and. Uh, give you the best we can with the time we have left. Um, uh, just a little bit about the organization that I work with. Uh, Charles House is uh, a 25-year-old nonprofit community aging services organization. We uh, have a highly respected daytime elder care uh, el center uh, where we provide daytime care and therapeutic activities. Uh, we have, we're pioneering neighborhood elder care homes, which we're going to talk about later. Uh, we also are uh, very involved in uh, supporting in, uh, caregivers, family caregivers, and in education, uh, as well as student uh, training, education, experiential learning, and uh, as well as advocacy in our community, which um, is where we have been involved uh, co-hosting a community, a two-year series, uh, discussion series, speaker series in our community on uh, aging in community. Um, and so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the big picture of aging in community, uh, the idea or a concept of age integrated neighborhoods, and again, uh, how neighborhood elder care homes can fit into that. So we all know the numbers. We hear this a lot these days that there are 10,000 of us every day turning 65. Um, and as Roger said, we're on a path of the aging population doubling. Um, in the next 15 years or so. But on the day that I blow out my 65 candles, I am not that concerned about what the other 9,999 people are doing that day because aging really is a very personal uh, experience. Um, so if we look at life expectancy, we get to, we blow out our 65 candles, we get to 70, we can expect to live, if we're a woman, we can expect to live another 16 years and uh, for us men, we can expect to live another 13 years. So if we were born on the 1st of July in the year of our birth, uh, actuarially we can, uh, if when we are 70, we can expect to die on January 18th, all you women, uh, of your 86th birthday, and, uh, and we'll live to be uh, to into September of that year for us at 83. And then if we add, so living adds life. Uh, at 85, uh, those life expectancy numbers gets us over 90, uh, both for men and for women. Um, so that's, uh, it, when we find ourselves there, I'm going to go to the numbers that count. 70% of us who get to be over 65 will, at some point in our lives, need long-term care support services. And once we get to be 85, we have a good 45% probability of developing some level of dementia. Those are kind of astonishing statistics for, for us in the field. Um, and then the, the years for women, they can anticipate needing to receive support services for just under four years. And for men, just 
uh, actuarially would be just um, over two years. So as we age, we are preparing for a period of our lives where we are going to need substantial support in our lives for two to four years. And where does that care come from? Well, we think of facilities and we think about capital, we think about building places, we think of nursing homes and so forth, but the vast majority, 78% of people who live in the community and receive care, receive it exclusively from their family and friends. Only 4% of the population live in nursing homes and assisted living facilities. They, the vast majority of all caring is happening in our communities by friends and families. So why do we talk about community? This is a mega data study that was done in 2010 and it looked at the issues of lower interaction. And here we're talking not about isolation, we're not talking about you know, one-legged people in a single room occupancy house someplace, we're talking about lower interaction. You know, I don't drive at night anymore. Uh, my daughter visits us on Saturdays. Uh, this kind of scenario. And what they found out is that lower interaction is worse on your health than smoking 15 cigarettes a day. It's as bad on your health as being an alcoholic. It's worse than not exercising. And it's twice as bad as being obese. So as we age, the number one thing that we have to do for ourselves is to consider how are we in community? How do we stay in connection and maintain higher levels of interaction? So traditionally, we've had a choice. We have been given the choice to pack up and move into the continuing care retirement communities where there's a built-in continuum of care. Um, or we plant our flag and we say they're going to carry me out of here feet first and we're stay where we are. Um, and I call that the gamble and because we've just been through the slide that says that 70% of us are going to need help. And that help is maybe more than we can get. And if you look at the front steps of the bungalow, as nice as they are, they probably mean I'm not going to be getting out very much. And then I'm starting lower interaction. And then I'm, you know, it's a cycle. So we are looking at aging in community as being a third way. Second Journey has published a book called Aging in Community that looks at various models of people intentionally taking on um, creating community for ourselves as we age. Some of the models, and this is not an exclusive list, the Villages model. Some of you know about um, Beacon Hill Village in Boston where an old established neighborhood aging in place. Uh, the, the, the population there of older people came together and decided to uh, grassroots uh, an organization that would support them being a tight-knit neighborhood and provide services that could help them stay in their homes. So sometimes aging in place is nothing more than denial. It is, I'm just going to stay here. And in other times, it really can be a coordinated, thoughtful, intentional approach to how do I responsibly deal with what I'm looking forward to in my aging years. Another model is shared housing. Sometimes this is called Golden Girls housing. So this is where two, three, four, five uh, people, um, often women, uh, as in the Golden Girls show, uh, get together and share housing. As we look at the emergence of the demographic of older women who are um, divorced, widowed, uh, and who have had careers in tr what have been traditionally female careers, we are seeing, I think, a growing population that could be very well suited to shared housing. Uh, both from an economic standpoint as well as their social propensity for connectedness um, and, uh, and sharing life. Um, elder co-housing. Co-housing is a model that's been around for, what, 20, 30 years, uh, imported from Denmark. And now there are specific co-housing communities that are ev uh, evolving, uh, focused on the elder, elder communities specifically. 
Sometimes they're done in collaboration with multi-generational co-housing communities, um, and also the, the co-ops, uh, New York co-ops and uh, elsewhere, uh, is another model of shared ownership, uh, shared control, um, and uh, sharing the decisions of, uh, of living together. Pocket neighborhoods uh, out of Seattle is another way of looking at downsizing the individual square footage of living, clustering uh, within a, the context of a larger neighborhood to create uh, accessibility, neighborhood connectedness, both among seniors, but also within the larger context of their uh, neighborhoods. Um, also a model that uh, would uh, be maybe challenging from a zoning standpoint in many um, uh, jurisdictions, but uh, definitely worth uh, looking at in the uh, out of what uh, has been a, the experience in Seattle with that. And Roger already mentioned uh, senior artist colonies. And I use this as an example of people coming together around specific uh, topic, uh, specific interest groups. So some groups are coming together under uh, religious interests and artists and so forth. So that's another way. Um, I put this uh, picture of the book uh, Pattern Language that's been around since the 70s. And many of us, I'm sure, are aware of it and what it says to us about building towns and houses and communities. In there, there's language about how we should be looking at neighborhoods and the agent, and so what, what I'm calling the age integrated neighborhood. Um, so as we look at aging, we can't cluster all old people in a group. I mean, we're talking about 40 years of life. Um, and so we break it down into three phases. Uh, the active years, um, where people are newly retired and, you know, living actively, traveling, taking care of all their affairs and yards and so forth. The supported life, uh, when there starts to be uh, uh, diminishment in the, um, uh, the uh, activities of daily living that might need some support. Again, knowing that most of that support is going to come from family and friends. And then what Norton Hadler, a physician at UNC Medical School, calls uh, the phase of frailty. It's a new phase of life, uh, that, that two to four years that we talked about before when we are going to need major support. So if we take these three phases and we look at it in the context of where many, many of us live in the suburban, uh, the model of the suburban neighborhood, we are saying that that suburban neighborhood can become an age-integrated neighborhood. Um, that in that larger context, the seniors and the aging, the people aging in those neighborhoods can look at three concentric circles of, of life in those neighborhoods. The outer ring being that, that independent seniors um, working together and in the age integrated neighborhood, they come together and they identify themselves as the neighborhood elders. Um, the inner ring being people uh, needing more assistance. Uh, but still wanting to live more independently. And then what uh, the pattern language refers to is the caring center or the caring core, uh, where people who do, who are in those last two to four years of needing assistance can still receive that assistance within their neighborhood. Um, and so this is a little bit of what I mentioned before. I want to identify that, that the idea that elders, that the active year elders can identify themselves in their neighborhood as a group of, of neighborhood elders to create neighborhood the way that we think of it back in the, in the idyllic age of, of uh, suburbia, but where neighborhoods are supporting uh, a resource for that activity is actually Dave Wan's book, uh, Superbia, which I think has been revamped uh, for the modern age. Uh, but steps that people can take to make a suburban neighborhood much more community oriented. Um, again, we talked about the inner ring, and that's where there, we might be looking at accessory units, granny flats, clustering cottages, maybe a pocket neighborhood, uh, those kinds of things in neighborhoods to allow people to migrate within their neighborhood for the level of care to stay integrated in their neighborhood. And then the caring core, and that's the, um, that's the elder care home uh, concept that we are pioneering in two neighborhoods. Um, that um, these are two pic pictures of two of our two neighborhood elder care homes. 
These are homes that exist in neighborhoods, within the fabric of neighborhoods. Um, they, uh, in the town of Carborough, North Carolina, which has the, had the zoning jurisdiction, has the zoning jurisdiction for uh, these homes, there was no special use permits uh, required. They had already uh, for, had foresight for these kinds of dwellings and had already uh, provided for them in their zoning ordinances. Um, they, um, they are facilities that are licensed under state health uh, regulations, uh, as well as life safety code uh, regulations and so forth. We have done both a retrofit and new construction, uh, both around uh, 2,500 square feet, which is when you consider six residents, that's a pretty tight uh, but a very livable space. So we've done uh, we, and then we manage the house with household teams, so we provide uh, work life as well. So the retrofit house, the new construction house, uh, and a picture uh, inside as well. Thanks, Paul. So the real take homes for us as planners is that we need to think about providing more um, housing options and better access to services for the aging population. And we are challenged by the fact that our zoning regulations in, in many communities that were originally designed for single-family residences really need to be updated to facilitate rather than inhibit living in community. Um, we, look at, we need to look at ways to integrate housing options for seniors into traditional neighborhoods so that we can create better health outcomes. Um, and really, you know, people want choices at the end of the day. Paul mentioned he didn't care about the other 9,999. <laughs> And that, I think that's true of most people. They, not everyone, there's no silver bullet, there's no one solution that's going to work for all. So we need to think about how we can accommodate many housing options for seniors. And again, partnering with new disciplines is going to be really critical as we think about um, how we implement all of these options over the future. So I'm going to touch on a couple of zoning tools. I'm going to go through these fairly quickly so we can um, leave some time for questions at the end. Um, the first one, this is really kind of the easiest, um, kind of basic thing you can do, allowing continuing care retirement communities um, by right in your zoning ordinances. Again, you know, Paul mentioned 4% of folks are actually going to stay at places like this. It's really out of the price range of many. And, you know, having an enclave of aging isn't necessarily the greatest idea either. You're not really uh, fostering multi-generational interaction or broader community interaction, but it is one option that we should be putting on the table. Um, another one is looking at adult care homes in all of the residential districts. Um, and Carver, North Carolina, we, we mentioned them earlier, they, have, they allow adult care home class A, which is for the infirm. And those are permitted in all their residential districts, so that's another opportunity for um, infusing some of that housing, particularly for that phase of frailty. Um, by right, accessory dwelling units, um, this is used a tool used for many different um, planning challenges, including affordable housing. It can be a great opportunity for your, your grandma to actually live in that granny flat. Um, and there are a lot of there's a lot of information out there about how to implement. I think one of the key things is that it's often met with nimbyism, and we, working in our communities, really need to educate citizens about the increase in property values that neighborhoods experience. A lot of times they think that they're going to bring down the neighborhood, and so there's more education we need to be doing to encourage people to support that tool. Um, we need to look at integrating different densities and housing types within residential districts. And there's some examples out there. There's an image here on the slide of Portsmouth, Virginia's urban residential district that really allows for a wide range of housing options, including attached residential apartment, condominium, mansion apartments. Um, there are context-sensitive context design standards for infill and redevelopment applications. Um, so that it's really important to think about providing, again, as many options as possible. Um, and then a, a little bit of a trickier one, allowing for the conversion of single-family homes into multiple separate apartments. Um, this is actually something that's been looked at over many decades for different reasons. Um, this would allow owners to stay in their own home um, and create um, new income. Potentially, um, the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority actually has a program called the Apartment Conversion for the Elderly Program, and they, they actually provide um, financial assistance for the construction of apartments um, for folks in this situation. So there, this is happening out there. I don't think it's very prevalent, but there are cases out there, particularly in Connecticut, to look to. 
Um, and shared housing by right, um, Paul mentioned this one, and um, if you go to the National Shared Housing site, um, there's a lot of great information there. There's really two kind of applications here for shared housing. One is the what they call the matchup, where there's an aging homeowner that's renting a bedroom um, or multiple bedrooms, and then there's a shared living residence, where it's typically a nonprofit that owns it, and they um, rent to different individuals. Um, this is uh, an interesting one because, typically speaking, these uses kind of fly under the radar of zoning, and um, the only real case where it comes, uh, where it could come up as a problem, is um, when other things like short-term rentals come around. So there's a there might be a need to distinguish between this kind of longer-term um, shared housing situation uh, for rentals as opposed to a short-term rental um, type. Um, application. And there are a few ways here that you can go about um, allowing shared housing to be permitted in your communities, thinking about revising your definition of family or using a definition of functional family, uh, reducing occupancy limits, those can help with um, supporting this type of use. Um, and then lastly here, um, thinking a little bit outside of housing, but the co-location of elder housing and care with child care schools, creating that multi-generational environment. And there are a few examples here where that's been done. Ithaca, New York has a Head Start program that's permanently housed within a retirement community. Rome, Georgia um, has a development that's a senior affordable housing development co-located with an early learning center. And I believe it's Rantoul, Illinois. I apologize if I mispronounced that. Generations of Hope, an interesting development that blends housing for foster families with aging seniors. So a lot of new um, applications out there um, to be looking at. So we're going to stop there, and we've got about 10 minutes, 11 minutes. So um, we would be happy to field any questions that you might have. Um, you can just type them into your question board. I've been seeing, um, just while these come in, I have been seeing several questions here about the PowerPoint um, presentation and the uh, recorded webinar being available. And we, we can make those available to you. I'm going to leave a slide up at the end that will have our contact information. And it, probably the easiest thing to do is send me an email. Um, and my email address, again, is laking at clarionassociates.com. I'll be happy to share those with you. So um, please send on any questions that you might have. OK, let's see. We've got one here. In our jurisdiction, I think we would be open to smaller lots, co-housing, and other options for seniors. However, we have limited ability to enforce an age-restricted community. So we have to look at these types of housing as being open to anyone, which is not as well supported. Do you have any ideas for how to enforce age restrictions, or if you think these areas should be age-restricted, or should they be open to anyone? Roger, do you have any thoughts yeah. on that one? Uh, this, this, this is Roger. Just a, 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 an anecdote and a thought. Uh, we're here in Chapel Hill University community, and uh, the co-housing or accessory dwellings are uh, often, probably predominantly, uh, uh, rented by students. So that's that that is an issue, and uh, and uh, I think that that's. That's not the case in every community, of course, uh, but I, I do think that's an issue. That, that's something that we probably ought to look into is to see what possibilities are for age restricting uh, the occupancy of a unit like that. That's that's a good question. I, <laughs> it's a tricky one. Yeah, I, I can tell you um, from a little bit I know about fair housing, but there is support um, from a fair housing standpoint for restricting to um, limit um, other age groups in support of seniors. Um, so there is some support from that standpoint, um, but good question. Um, let's see. Okay, so there's another question here. If you've got the time, was there anything on the skip slides worth going back to? Well, what I can share with you there is that um, we basically had several slides walking through the APA policy guide on aging in community. And we're going to provide you in the a next slide with a link to get that document. So it's really a several summary slides about that. Um, that's probably um, the best way to get that information since we just have a few minutes left. Okay, another question here. Any examples of age-restricted housing that includes seniors as well as young, younger households, including families with children? So any examples of age-restricted Age inter, excuse me, not restricted, age integrated housing that includes seniors as well as younger households, including families with children. 
a couple that I've that I'm familiar with. There's there's a, a co-housing, a senior co-housing community that is specific, and I don't remember where it is, but they are their specific mission is that they come together as seniors to be foster parents. So it's a co-housing community of um, an intentional community of seniors that is actually multi-generational by their mission. Um, and they worked out that sort of thing. Another one that's local in Pearson County, um, there's a co-housing community that is spawning, if you will, a an, uh, an elder co-housing adjacent called Elderberry. And so the older members of that intergenerational co-housing community is, is actually in the process of building a cluster community, uh, co-housing community adjacent. So they will continue to be part of the uh, intergenerational uh, co-housing community, but will be focused uh, in their own cluster of co-housing as well. Those are two examples I think of. Uh, this is Roger. There's one, one other example that I'm aware of uh, uh, that uh, where a development is being built, it's a mixed-use development. So it's got a residential, retail, office, uh, and the one one of the one of the buildings is going to be age restricted. Uh, and uh, but it's it's in very close proximity. It's being built along with the other, so it'll be right next door to another building on the street that is not age restricted, which which we expect to be uh, younger people and, and families with children. So it'll be uh, the, the building uh, might be separate, but uh, it will have common open space, common sidewalk and dining and everything else as you walk out the door. Let's see, we've got a few more minutes. There's a question here, possible to operate a senior daycare as a co-op to address family caregiver at work? I, I'm, I don't know what that means as a co-op. Um, if you're saying, can you do it like like uh, parents do uh, child care co-ops, um, that's an intriguing idea. Um, the uh, the senior daycare uh, is a fairly complicated issue and is also regulated in the state and in every state that I know of. Uh, so that provides some complication. However, if you're talking about caregiving families coming together and finding their own solution. I don't think there's any reason why they should be discouraged from doing so. There's a question here about Hope Meadows. I'm wondering if that's a development potentially that someone's interested in. We have just a few more minutes if there are any more questions out there. I think what I'll do, go ahead and do is um, put up We've got a couple more um, slides here, a few resources that you might be interested in taking a look at. Um, again, the Aging and Community Policy Guide, those were the um, slides, unfortunately, that we didn't get to go through in this presentation, but that policy guide is available at that link there through the American Planning Association. Uh, there's another report that came out this past year, Housing America's Older Adults Meeting the Needs of an Aging Population, put out by the Joint Center for Housing Studies of Harvard University. Um, and we've got another um, slide here that has examples and references of other projects that you might be um, interested in. And again, I'll leave my um, our um, contact information up here. Send me an email at laking at clarionassociates.com if you would like access to the presentation or the um, recorded webinar. Looks like we've got one other question here. When converting to a single when converting a single family home into elder care or co-housing, or multiple apartments for seniors, do special building codes come into play? I'm not sure if there are any additional building codes that would necessarily come into play. I think that, I think that varies by state. In, in North Carolina, uh, I'm not aware of any building code uh, that would come into play. It's more just the, uh, just the zoning uh, rules about number of dwellings and, and, and occupancy and so on. So I don't think that there's probably a, a building code issue there. Well, there is for uh, elder care homes. Elder care homes are licensed care facilities uh, so, um, under the State Department of Health. So, so the, the state building, the state life, life and safety code does come into play, uh, both uh, that is, uh, and, and then is supervised by the Department of Health and Human Services. So when you go into uh, uh, services that are licensable by the state, then you're going to be bringing in that level of, of uh, scrutiny and oversight. 
and that's going to change state by state what those Absolutely. code provisions are. Right. Let's see. Got a, just a few more minutes to see if we've got any more questions. Any I have uh, a an encouragement I'd like to offer, I think, and that's uh, uh, to the, the planners who are listening. And that the uh, I think that it is our responsibility as planners to be uh, to be really pushing these issues because because there really are some regulatory barriers and opportunities that uh, that we can help influence and we can help change. And I think that uh, we're the ones in our communities that tip, that generally have our finger on the pulse of what the trends are and what's coming. And so I think that it's responsibility of planners to bring some of these issues to the attention of our elected officials and uh, and policymakers, and to be uh, <clears throat> be advocates for making the changes to our plans and regulations to allow these kinds of uh, opportunities to take place. Great. So we've got just a minute more. Um, again, um, please send me an email if you have any additional questions after the webinar or if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint or a copy of the actual webinar itself. We'll be glad to share that with you so that you can send to your colleagues or listen to it again. Um, we appreciate you signing on. Um, we hope that you um, were able to learn something. And thank you, Roger and Paul, for uh, being here today to um, share this information and your experiences. Um, we hope you have a great uh, day and you've got great weather wherever you are. And um, thanks for joining.